Welcome everyone. This is the third session of this afternoon of the first day of the Berlin Demography Days. I'm very happy to welcome you. I'm Monica Kweiser. I'm head of the Department for Social Policy at uh, OECD in Paris and I'm very much looking forward to this debate which is dedicated to the topic of politics, namely how can politics better support young people. We all know that at the end of the day, it's always implementation that creates bottlenecks. We might have good ideas, but if we can't implement them with the right political goals, using the right measures and including the participation of young people who best can tell us what they need in order to best manage the different phases of their lives, the transition from school to work, and other important uh, turning points in their lives, we will fail. So we really need to make sure that in a political process, we best support young people and also include them and let them participate. We have a wonderful panel with us. We'll start out with a keynote, keynote speech delivered by Professor Birgit Reitzig. She's the head of um, the research unit for youth transitions at the German Youth Institutes. This institute is very important to consult in the school to work transition phase of young people's lifetimes and she'll be dedicating the keynote to that. She's also honorary professor for youth research at the University of Applied Sciences in Leipzig. Professor Reisig, I'll directly give the floor to you so we can get started very much looking forward to your keynote speech. Thank you for introducing me and let me welcome you to panel number four of this afternoon. And as said, we will dedicate this panel to the question of how politics can better support young people. I can only say this if from the perspective of applied sciences. And um, one first aspect I would like to mention in this regard is that politics, independently of the level it acts on, needs to ground its work on data and derive the measures it takes from that. So this is what I would like to say as a starting point. I've prepared a short statement which splits into three areas. I would like to focus on selected topics because speaking about young people in the coming of age is um, quite an ample subject. So I'd like to narrow the perspective down. I would also like to prepare some empirical data about the topic and in a third part, take the data to draw on that and filter some policy agenda items from there. So very much looking forward to the further debate. I would like to focus on education and on the transition points from the professional training into the labor market, into the workplace phase. And also, I would like to speak about what this means for participation in society, because this is what it is linked to. In research, we see financial independence, building up one's own home, starting a family, all that is related to the question of where young people can find a position in the labor market and how well they can access training programs. We know for the case of Germany that a completed university career protects against this unemployment and also any other sort of complete completed professional training. I would also like to take a look at the major trends that are underlying these developments. And also I would like to take a look at the expectations and needs that young people have themselves. Looking at the labor market and the working world, it is marked by megatrends. 
we see technological and economical developments, globalization keeps on being a contemporary issue. We have digitization as another mega trend to observe. And then we have some demographic changes that point at a further aging in society, even though there are regional differences, in particular in Germany. We've been observing that. And then we have major challenges like climate change or the scarcening of certain resources in the world. These are all factors we can't neglect as we look at the labor market and at the transitions in young lives in general. On the other hand, the question is what do young people actually want for their lives? What are they dreaming of? What are they imagining and planning? Youth research has been seeing limitless worlds, uh, worlds without reasonable clarity for young people. There are trends for young people helping them or making them want to find a safe job. Young people value free time and financial safety financial security, but they also value a sense of purpose in life. It's always important to say young people are not objects. They are not the object of politics either, but they are acting subjects. We've heard about this before. We can see this when it comes to sustainability and we also explicitly ask for this. Let me come to the second point of my considerations. I would like to come to some contemporary findings on the school to profession transition. These might provide some starting points for political action. Some content has been presented here before looking at schools, especially at the preparation of that transition, then we can still see a continued trend on uh, higher qualification in Germany, most kids change to go to the highest level secondary school after completing fourth grade and are striving to obtain the highest degree of qualification, which is um, the university admission qualifying school leaving certificate. We do see a certain distribution along the um, social background the kids have, but it is still a trend. In preparing the name transition, we still have um, very traditional values looking at what young people express. If we look at what young people with um, medium to low qualifications on what their ideas of a good job is, then they uh, look at very traditional values. For example, a shop assistant is a profession young people speak about. It's a pretty narrow spectrum of professional choice and it is very much gendered, in this case, separated by gender. Professions that um, include digitization and structural change is not something young people of that group look at. In our own studies, we've been able to see a growing uncertainty even before the pandemic, this was the case. Almost 50% of the medium to low education holders, but also from the highest level Contemporary school leavers said to us that they were not sure whether any sort of perspective made sense for them. So not even a couple of years were um, forecastable for these kids. So that might create something we call progression strain on the young kids. So it's hard for them to forecast what the future will hold. If we take it one step further and take a look at findings from the field of training, of professional training, 
then it is striking to see if an effect that was even reinforced by the COVID-19 pandemic is a paradox. On the one hand, we have vacant positions for training. There are companies offering, offering places for professional training. And on the other hand, we have a high share of teenagers, of young people who would want to um, undergo professional trainings, but who cannot, for reasons we yet do not know, make a choice. There is a third aspect I want to draw on. It was a lot of discussion in the last decade. It's the so-called transition system, which is part of the education system. The transition system offers schemes and programs in the pre-qualification field, a program offering help well again and again it was said the transition system it was no longer necessary because uh, we still see as in the past one fourth of uh, the school leavers um, is placed uh, ad interim in this uh, what we call transition system. If you look into the labor market, especially from a German perspective, we have the rather comfortable situation. We have a relatively low unemployment rate among the youth of uh, during pandemic hovering around 5%, which is uh, by international standards, a rather positive piece of news. It's rather low. Yet at the same time, due to the risk of poverty, we see a higher risk of poverty. And there's so many atypical forms of employment, especially for the young people, especially when it comes to low wage jobs, part-time jobs, or time limited jobs. Well, it hits harder at young people than all other employees, especially when we look at time limited employment, 60% uh, of uh, those who are employed in the age of under 35% uh, work uh, in time limited employment contracts. Uh, it depends very much on the qualification or the school leaving exam, the lower the school leaving certificate, or if you have not any certificate at all, the higher the share of the time limited employment relationships and all the more difficult will it be to reach an unlimited employment. So social inequality that uh, is uh, very heavily impacting on future perspectives. What does it mean for possible starting points for action? Well, this spectrum of vocational training, decision um, options is uh, very narrow. Uh, we have this mismatch between the requests and the offer of vacancies in the vocational training scheme. We need to discuss this early on. The earlier on you start, the better. So we need to start talking about future employment, the vocational training earlier on. What should also be given some thought is uh, to have a long term orientation an orientation period uh, is not over you will again and again have uh, stages in your life where you need reorientation intermediate steps are frequent uh, in the after school life uh, where nothing has been decided finally yet and again it's important to see this and to assist people and to not leave them behind Probably it should also be a task that should be shouldered at the very beginning. Practice, practice, practice plays an important role. What we do have in the dual training, the duale Ausbildung, this hand in hand of theory and practice should also be laid out in this orientative phase between school and uh, employment. This transitional system, it is not obsolete. It is certainly 
a firm pillar in the education vocational system and it must be expanded to a higher degree it needs to be implemented much stronger individual potentials must be tapped into you should also or we should examine more carefully whether previous qualifications should be recognized and uh, all the many actors that are active in this field need to coordinate it much better so it's uh, transition management the municipalities need to be strengthened another point uh, that uh, is uh, really to be taken seriously within the training or the vocational training not only until you have reached the beginning of a vocational training course but even beyond that we need to take care in politics. Uh, people with a migratory background, with a background as refugees, people with low uh, career opportunities, people with low qualifications, how can we tailor our standards in such a way and how can we loosen them so that it is possible for those people not only to enter such a training course but also to complete the whole program, part-time vocational training, much more flexibility even within the training schemes. That would certainly be beneficial. Which brings me to the last point. Uh, from my point of view, a few principles emerge that will matter if politics want, really wants to take uh, supporting measures if they really want uh, to reach uh, out to the, uh, the young children and uh, adolescents. It's not just a data collection, not only the diagnosis. What do we want to achieve? But uh, also as a review and a monitoring, what is uh, the effect of those measures that I have taken? Second, and we have touched upon this uh, repeatedly today, it is the principle of participation. How can young people be involved, be listened to, and also in the design of measures? How can they be involved even in the design of our schemes and measures? Another principle, I would describe it as holistic principle. On the one hand, in the sense that a longer part of the biography is taken into view. So it's, I pointed this out before, things never end. So you should develop all your life. Different areas of life should be thought together. For example, good educational training. Good vocational training will also help you in maintaining better health. We also need a well-balanced uh, relationship between measures uh, pointing at structures, uh, education management, uh, support lent to municipalities, uh, and also individually taken measures. Both types of measures are needed, but we need to balance it out uh, in a sophisticated manner. Of course, we also need the principle of uh, diversity, that uh, diversity be respected and measured by individual requirements, what groups need, what type of support. This uh, relates also to spatial conditions, for example, regional differences that need to be never lost sight of. Um, so that uh, certain regions need other supportive measures than others. And finally, the last point, well, I would like uh, to address resilience in times of crisis, because again, this is something that at the latest uh, in times of Corona, we have taken to heart and have learned such crisis uh, that cannot be foreseen, but nonetheless, how can such crisis uh, be coped with in such a way that least possible damage is done, that nothing breaks down. We have seen it uh, so often how 
often very little could be achieved. And so we need to shape things in a more resilient way so that they can withstand crisis better. Thank you very much for this attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Reisig. Uh, so many questions, so many inspiring ideas uh, that uh, raise uh, the willingness to discuss it. How can we manage that politicians can implement all those good ideas? I found it highly interesting what you said about the German situation. It is reflected in the OECD area where we have the strong socioeconomic gradient of, of parental home and educational opportunities. Uh, very few countries get it done. So uh, everybody wants to know how could they achieve such good PISA results, but anything pointing here in the educational directorate, uh, the traditional uh, vocation, it's frightening to see international still firefighter and policemen. No kidding about that. Without any um, the embellishing, well, they fall back on traditional professions, also a strong gender related uh, perspective. Even if uh, women have studied uh, meant, uh, so mathematics or engineering or scientific uh, subjects, they will still go to the traditional female roles. Uh, so, so many fallbacks to traditional roles. I find it particularly pleasing that uh, the evaluation plays an ever bigger role in the OECD. We have this, uh, the modern education employment uh, training. I do not know how to pronounce it in German. So we look at the picture, we look uh, country specific, uh, what uh, programs do work and what others don't. So the strong individualization, regionalization, participation of the youth. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion that must follow because I think we are going to hear from many good examples. I would not say we just need a huge national strategy and everything will be fine. No, we need to carefully look for good examples, best practices, things that work, uh, at a grassroots level and why do they work and can they be transferred while others probably cannot so this a very detailed picture how can we make those many facets into a overarching political apparatus so we do have an official panelist professor dr karin Böllert. she is uh, the uh, chairperson of the Child and Youth Welfare Association, an honorary, she's also a professor at University of Minnesota with a focus on children's and youth health in view of social policies. Uh, Ms. Bellard, uh, we are looking forward to listening to it. I can only refer to some partial aspects uh, that Birgit Reisig mentioned a huge uh, national newspaper title that in the last two years, thousands and thousands of adolescents had disappeared from the screen because they do not appear in any statistics, neither in the vocational training statistics, nor in the employment statistics, nor in the academic statistics. They have not started an academic training, nor do they attend school, probably after a uh, certificate in vocational training, they have not found an employment. Now, these young people, in my view, are hit hard uh, by, or they have failed uh, by, by way of Corona pandemic and because of the Corona pandemic, because uh, I would say access to a career and access to employment was uh, difficult uh, even before, but now it is hitting hard on them those youths uh, that had taken a rather linear education program as uh, to be taken for granted. Many important milestones were lacking. There were no traineeships, no internships, no vocational training fairs were organized. Uh, open door days were not offered. So what is uh, even more decisive? Um, the young people voiced their concerns, but they have not been listened to. I think uh, this morning, Wolfgang Schröer pointed this out. Politics 
have proved to be not resilient to crisis. And I think this has been hammered down very convincingly by Birgit Reisig. So many disadvantaged young people were affected particularly. However, the care, the, the concern about their future is shared by them with so many other of uh, their peers. Uh, Bertelsmann Stiftung has issued a, a survey that 54% of the young people in Germany take it that their um, educational opportunities have shrunk, particularly due to Corona. 42% of those youths criticize that politics does too little or nothing at all for the search for vocational training posts. Well, this should uh, serve as a shrill wake-up call in front of this perception and this warning that the young people themselves voice. By the way, more than one third of uh, the young generation believes that there are too few vocational training places uh, Birgit Reisig uh, pointed this out. So many trades are looking desperately for trainees. You can hardly cross the street or drop by anywhere. So everywhere you can read, really we are waiting for you to become part of our team. On the other hand, the number of training jobs of uh, apprenticeships has dwindled due to Corona. This left uh, fault lines or has even exacerbated, exacerbated fault lines. How can politics support a helpful hand? Let's take a look at the coalition agreement. We want to uh, release a guarantee for vocational trading, ensuring all youths uh, full access to uh, full vocational training. We want to treat this with priority. You can read it. Such a warranty for a training post, but this has not yet been described or laid out in detail. It's not yet fixed. Without any shadow of a doubt, I think it would be desirable if we have something like an entitlement uh, to vocational training for every young person, independently of any starting point, disadvantaged, far from academic. Uh, parental homes and so on. However, it would be important from the perspective of young people. It's not just any vocational, uh, according to the motto, the main thing is that you just learn uh, any trade, but that it must correspond to the wishes and the requests of the young people, according to the motto. That's how imagine my professional future. I have so many questions to ask. I need something like an individual life course planning, but my own wish for my future employment is the starting point of any further considerations, which would also lead to a state where we do not long, no longer have uh, the current status where you have uh, coercive training courses, which leads in the final date or at the end of the day to hire an uh, early leavers share with uh, the negative consequences uh, for all of us, but especially for those who leave their training post. Uh, on top of all that, it is of uh, the utmost importance that these young people must be enabled to develop uh, vocationally training related future perspectives. What you should, however, not restrict yourself to a very restricted or gender specific segment, but to enact this. And to achieve this, some of the young people need something like a professional guidance. They need support and guidance uh, by the vocational youth help, it would not be only participative uh, justice, but also enabling justice. In the context of such a warranty for training, the children and youth help would not be left out of their competency and responsibility or would exempt itself from the final responsibility and would then be able to use uh, the 
released resources for different purposes. So the target perspective would coping with uh, the challenges of uh, vocational training as a self-determined path to the self-managed future. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Bellard. Again, so many questions emerge. How can we do that? You pointed out that at times uh, the perspective of a stable future can get lost altogether because at times they don't see it. And of course, at the OECD, we also say later on our kids will work in jobs that do not even exist today, of which we have no knowledge right now. We always need a certain skills anticipation to know about the skills of the future. But apart from that, for politics, just like for teachers, professors, parents, everyone who has contact and is in touch with young people, it isn't easy to forecast what the future will hold. Of course, around imagination and around vision is all marked by what we know from history and from what our parents did. And of course, young people need to say goodbye to this. Sabina Schutter, you are um, the chairperson of SOS Children's Villages. What do you think? What were you thinking as you were listening to the input keynotes just now? Well, I would like to take a totally different perspective, different from the one we just heard of, even though it's not so different with regard to content. I would first of all like to explain the perspective from which I take the floor. Those children that grow up with us cannot grow up with their natural parents. They bring some delays in their development with them, which also has an impact on their future perspective. But also those kids who do grow up with their parents often have disadvantages in their education because they do not receive all the support other kids receive. So the perspective of the young people that I am taking here is a very special one because it shows a combination of a number of disadvantages that these kids start into their lives with. And what Ms. Reisig and Ms. Böllard have just said has emphasized that the phase of youth has a clear position in life. There are very evident marks that uh, kids must have reached by a certain age. If they haven't, then they are delayed. There's always a certain phase in life that certain support measures are linked to. SOS Children also offers professional uh, vocation guidance trainings. And I'm often told, you know what, uh, Ms. Schutter, those kids that we assist have a hard time getting up in the morning. And then they take a whole year to learn um, how to get up in the morning. And then they start thinking about the vocational training they might be interested in. For those kids, we need a sort of flexible planning so that we can react and respond to uh, the mental health situation the kids are in. So we won't get all um, tangled up in one year long measures that might not fit in with the reality of these te teenagers. So this is what I can see from practical implementation. This in turn leads me to an overall plea and call for um, a time allocation related politics for teenagers. The pandemic has shown us that there can be two years with lockdowns and school closures, and then one full year of the school biography is gone. If we relate that experience to the lives of young people, young, young people in the transition between school and professional life, then that means that the time and biographic developments of young people needs to be conceived in a more flexible way to give them the feeling that it is okay if they need more time. The consequence of the pandemic that young people showed wasn't just that they, that wasn't that they wanted to go to school a year more, but they said we want to leave school at 18 anyway, instead of just taking a year longer. This is because we've all 
inhaled this um these measures these benchmarks in our heads that we cannot really separate ourselves from that perspective and this is the first of my of my pleas and the not the, the other one i wanted to raise refers to young people who come from inpatient assistance measures or healthcare measures that will that might never leave any qualification or professional training measure successfully and they might be living on state benefits from the start so the question is what chances are there for the for the chanceless for those who simply don't make it can it be our only goal to say sdg2 is fully fulfilled can't we say we will create a possibility for work for young people who are not disabled mentally or physically but who have a different kind of um, disability and the third thing i wanted to call for is more lightness and more positivity as we speak of the phase of youth, youth we speak um, about a, a phase in life that is supposed to have an achievement in itself so being young as a phase of becoming going somewhere instead of seeing it as a phase of being which is also a possibility maybe i'm too old but the phase of youth for me was a phase of recklessness i was trying myself out I would be doing things that I won't do today and offering young people that phase in life and saying to them, waste your time if you wish, waste your youth. This is something I would also want to call for. This is my third plea. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Schutter. This was a strong plea. In fact, uh, very interesting to think about what that could mean for politics more time leaving more time more positivity more lightness i think we can all agree to that and the mental load that the covered pandemic has um meant for young people something we see in all the ocde oecd countries also this uh, gives us great concern and we don't know how to turn this around in the short term either so offering confidence being positive and not missing the boat on the other hand, I think that's the conflicting interest here. On the one hand, we know we have to take the drama out the situation. On the other hand, we shouldn't miss the design of creating the future for those who might not see a future for themselves, as you just quite rightly mentioned the SOS child and youth villages um, work with kids with many problems in Paris, 25% uh, of all homeless people are former kids from um, a family who would take care of them and who wasn't their biological family, then we can see that there is a long-term impact and it's not people who are 20 today but it's people who are 50 today and tell us about their lives so now i would like to open the floor for further debate and discussion i would like to ask our participants to use uh, the q and a and the chat function i think you can use both please ask your questions um to your speakers but just simply leave your comments and if you want to take the floor let me know i have a number of people on my list i would like to start with afrodita fojajela of, of um stiftung zukunft in berlin foundation for the future Ms. bojadieva the floor is yours hi there i hope you can hear me thank you for your input. There were many things I jotted down on my blog here. I'm part of the Europe team at the Foundation for the Future, Berlin-based. So I might be able to offer a European perspective on a topic. 
there's a number of topics that play a role here. And in the COVID-19 pandemic, the impact is also visible throughout all Europe. In particular, many exchange programs who had been very successful already, which used to give young people the chance to leave their own country for a while, were closed down for some time and that's a pity and we can see from the teenagers that they weren't that interested because uh, they had to do so much for school and were so much dealing with subsistence and existence related problems that they weren't as interested as before and as Ms. Schutter said it is the time in which you can just simply go for it um, and live your experiences live your life think out of the box and for that younger generation it has become so difficult they are under pressure and are not taking time for that either truly a shame apart from that i would like to tell you what we do we offer formats and offerings with low entry barriers for young people and for adults. These are offers for inclusion. We want to strengthen young people's awareness, awareness for, for the round city, neighborhood, country and for United Europe. So whatever they do, be it in cultures, in, in be it in culture or be it in an association. The idea is to create awareness of the many possibilities there are so that young people can start shaping their own lives. But this in fact is a challenge. We see this with the events we host over and over we can attract those who were interested in the first place anyway it is a challenge to reach out to those who weren't it's a challenge to reach out to those who are not traditionally part of that circle of committed people thank you very much that was a most important point and a question i would have asked all the three speakers how do we reach out? How do we reach out to those who are most in danger? How do we reach out to those who might um, live on state benefit after they finish school or after they don't finish school? What can we do for them? So um, how can we help them? Where do we have to turn in order to reach out to these people? In France, for example, the government has launched a campaign called uh, Un Jeune, Une Solution, One Young Person and One Solution. And um, they, that campaign has a lot of media advertising. When you go to the cinema, the first thing you see is that advert. And this is one possibility, but you might know more. Now I have Ms. Schutter and then Ms. Bullard. Thank you. I have a micro example again at SOS Children's Villages. We have a children and um, youth workshop where the young people speak for themselves. I speak to them once a month and they can tell me what they're what um, their worries and, and thoughts are. And this is always my favorite date. And I tell them that and then they say to me, it's not enough for you to tell us that you like meeting up with us. You need to do more. So we try to offer these young kids to speak out, for example, to MPs um, in Dusseldorf before the federal state elections. We hosted an event where young people were able to hand over a letter with pleas to the candidates before the election and what i saw there at that event was that yeah one young woman said can we please talk less because this is so boring 
And I thought this was really, really um, interesting because young people who have their own ideas of life but might not be so traditionally educated might need to be offered a different sort of format for their participation and, and involvement. So we need to find formats that can work. It can be short videos, video chats, online debates. And yes, one thing that needs to be done is to coach young people, to offer them training so they won't be scared to raise their voices in such a setting. But we've had very good experiences with this. Let's hear Ms. Ballet now. Thank you. Well, young people with difficulties who never undergo professional training or who never start into the labor market, we need to place more trust in them too. The question was just raised on the European perspective. I would like to follow up on that. There are some studies about Germany showing or surveys rather, asking young Germans who might be called part of a disadvantaged group, whether they could imagine venturing on a European exchange program. And then they usually say, yes, we would love to do that, but we are too scared to do that. And we might expect that sort of an answer, but the challenge is the fall is as follows we asked the experts what would you think if your teenagers participated in such a measure and the experts uh, the educators said it would be great but they'll never make it so um we still see this vision of um, a course in life in which your certificates and your examinations will mark the options you get. But there are political rooms for action in those areas that are not so intellectually dominated. It's part of political education too. What Ms. Schutter does at SOS Children's Villages, offering co-shaping and co-designing spaces for the young people who say they want to speak out and who say they want to shape the place where they live together with others. This sort of experience is important, not leaving that to coincidence. I think doing that would be the right step. So what Ms. Schutter said, and it um, sounds good. I mean, of course, having more time, uh, taking the speed out, offering young people time and all that is something that these young people would love to do, but which because of the disadvantages in their lives, they will not be able to do because they won't find the time to just simply go there, go on a trip somewhere because the money is not there. And their parents will not say, just go on a world trip and whenever you come back, you know what you want or um, go um, take part in an Erasmus program to study abroad. This is an experience these young people will not have and they haven't had this beautiful um, teenage or youth years experience. So it's our task now beyond these obligations in the labor market to offer young people precisely that. And it's, it's possible if you want to do that, but they can't do it by themselves. They need professional help. Let me turn back to you, Ms. Bellert. Ms. Schutter can work at the SOS Children's Village directly and can mobilize these young people who are already there. But how about the others, those who are not yet part of such a, a scheme or program? How can we get them back? Well, first of all, we have um, children and youth work activities in many communities, in many neighborhoods, there's neighborhood management concepts where we can offer these kids something. It is just all too often that we forget about them. And in our work with uh, kids and young people, we can do something like election preparations, but not by sitting, having them sit at the table to um, make take notes the whole day long, but by offering something that appeals to them and politics needs to come in too. If the mayor of a municipality 
our community visits a youth social club for example there was a youth uh, a, 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 a young people's breakfast in uh, the port where the breakfast table would be set and you could then uh, have breakfast with politicians with mps who would sit and have breakfast with you and you could talk to them but later on you would need to make sure that it wasn't just all about pretty images for the mayor but it was all about checking on him and uh, seeing whether they were serious about what they said i can tell you it is so much fun to move out of the box and uh, both the addressee as well as the professionals will lend you an open ear because you can make so many sensible experiences uh, miss reisig you had asked for the floor well so many things have uh, dropped in that uh, regard me especially the last things uh, that karin bellard mentioned uh, from our interviews in this area one thing becomes clear if nothing happens if there is no consequence for example you may trigger a huge process of participation young people drop by and were extremely motivated not only those who had come to see us anyway but then the next step is to implement those steps uh, to become self-efficient to see something well this is quite often the crunch then these are political processes political processes are cumbersome and lengthy here you need to find formats or you need uh, to find ways and methods to generate immediate consequences an immediate effect whenever we uh, conduct uh, interviews with uh, the so-called disadvantaged youths they have a tale or two to tell you so karen you mentioned this already i think this is a uh, much of a problem well the place as well probably it will not be to your liking i believe uh, that um, schools may play a good role in this context especially whole day schools uh, i think they have uh, good access uh, to youths uh, that would not come on their own across such an initiative uh, apart from the non-formal opportunities that school may offer let me add another remark on the question of time that was addressed here because this is something that can be valued quite differently we see it in the entire research and studies on the youth uh, the big buzzword de-standardization everything sets on later we know those figures uh, but the appraisal is very different who does what for example uh, if someone travels abroad for a, a european international stint in another country then there is an extremely positive connotation then this cushion between school and uh, the next formal training is highly valued but if you do nothing it is totally uh, underestimated or it it is uh, valued on a different level well, this moratorium what do you intend shouldn't uh, such a moratorium be treated on an equal footing last week i attended a conference where several european countries attended norway for example they have uh, a gap uh, a moratorium uh, funded independently of the parents so they may now take their own decision so and it will not lead to a further discrimination thank you miss schutter well i just wanted to highlight this uh, yes i have been brief yeah that's exactly this image i wanted to point out at the contradictory character we have gap years and uh, traveling around the world and then this measure limited to one year and then you will be left on your own on the street this is an inner conflictuality between acceleration and deceleration and i also want to second what uh, miss reisig and miss burlard said yes 
something must happen. Yes, our young people, whenever we want to take them along, take them along and then nothing spins out of this uh, comment, then they lose any interest. Uh, even if they have colorful photographs left on their way, <laughs> they are not so dumb as not to notice. Uh, a question to all three of you and also probably to Ms. Rutter. So if you have just one wish, no matter what level, national level, regional level, local level, what would be the highest priority? What should politics do? Ms. Reisig, do you want to start? Well, it's certainly not so easy, but I would, yes, I would say we need good support, a warranty for a vocational training post so that uh, you have a supporting level. The essentials must be ensured. So that should be the direction or the bearing in which we should move. Miss Bellot, what would be your more urgent uh, need or request? A warranty for a no commission, but not in the sense that uh, the business complains about lack of skilled workers, but as a token of appreciation of young people, we could take a time account. There are young people who need longer for their time. So what? And we would should give them the time that they need to complete this uh, training program. Ms. Schütter, what would be your wish? Well, I take it easy. I <laughs> declare my agreement on anything. And on top of that, the lowering of the election right. Uh, well, which one? to 16 years, then we would have in, involve a relevant uh, target group. And of course, you would have to do something for this group. Uh, Ms. Boyajieva, do you want also to formulate your wish? I agree. And I would say that good things, everything that has been stated. I also think it is important to create structures for youth um, involvement on a local level we need a structure that allows them to not only to involve them, but also to bring them forward and to benefit. Wonderful. Let's hope uh, that politicians have been listening to us uh, that are going to implement this. But I assume that we, there will be an executive summary of our discussions that we can hand over to the political level. I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all those valuable contributions and ideas. So many things that we can elaborate on later in the further course of the discussions. I, I take it that uh, we will mm, be discussing this set of problems uh, further.